Hello, everyone. I'm Ambassador Mark Green, president of the Wilson Center. For the last six months, the center has devoted extensive time to analyzing the implications and lessons learned from the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. We've called this work Hindsight Up Front because we hope to offer these insights to policymakers and opinion leaders in real time while the events are still occurring in and around Afghanistan. We focused on what the U.S. withdrawal means for Afghanistan, but also for the U.S., our transatlantic partners, for regional players, and for U.S. competitors, both great powers and the sponsors of extremist violence. We've looked back and taken stock of the withdrawal, but we're also looking forward to analyze what Afghanistan's future may look like, the humanitarian crisis, human rights, security risks, and the Taliban's actions since it has taken power. Hindsight Up Front has been led by Eurasia program, but it's really a center-wide initiative. Multiple Wilson Center programs have helped bring influential voices to the table. Former senior U.S. and allied officials, top experts from India, Pakistan, China, and Russia, and the brave voices of Afghanistan leaders and the young Afghan women that we all worry about so much. To view some of these discussions and access a treasure trove of our scholarship and analysis on Afghanistan, you can visit the Hindsight Upfront website, which is afghanistan.wilsoncenter.org. As we mark six months from the date of the withdrawal, we're going to briefly return to where our Hindsight Upfront series began, the conversation with the co-chairs of the Wilson Center's Global Advisory Council, General David Petraeus and Sir John Scarlett. Dave Petraeus, as I think everyone knows, served in the military for more than 37 years in posts ranging from the head of multinational forces in Iraq, commander in chief of the Central Command, and commander of U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan. He later served as CIA director. Sir John Scarlett served for several decades in the British Secret Intelligence Service, known as MI6, including the role of chief of MI6 from 2004 to 2009. Gentlemen, thank you again for joining us in Afghanistan's hindsight up front. So uh, gentlemen, looking back for each of you, what are the biggest lessons that you take away from the withdrawal? General Petraeus, I'll start with you. Well, if you look at what I think the outcome has been, uh, so let me offer that first if I could, uh, Ambassador Mark, uh, and great to be with you uh, and always great to be reunited with Sir John, uh, I think that the outcome can only be described as heartbreaking, um, tragic, uh, and disastrous. Uh, it's heartbreaking for the Afghans, needless to say, uh, to face the kind of privation, repression, uh, return to a seventh century interpretation of ultra-conservative Islam. Um, it is tragic in so many ways uh, to see a government that, however imperfect it was, however even corrupt it may have been, was such a good partner, a great partner, really, when it came to our efforts to ensure that Islamist extremists could not reestablish sanctuaries on Afghan soil the way Al-Qaeda uh, had when the 9-11 attacks were planned uh, on that soil in the initial training of the attackers was carried out in Afghanistan as well. When, yeah, yeah. And in many ways, it's disastrous in the sense that it allowed our potential adversaries to say, see, we told you so. We told you the Americans can't be depended on. They're not, not solid allies and partners. Uh, and we told you that they're a great power in decline. Now, I don't believe either of those. And I think we are showing in our steadfast support together with our NATO and EU and other allies and partners in the free world uh, that we are determined uh, in the case of Ukraine. Uh, but this certainly did create some doubt. Uh, and it showed that we just lacked the strategic patience to continue an effort that, however frustrating, um, I felt, again, should have been continued and could have been in a way that was sustainable. Uh, and sustainability is measured here in terms of uh, blood and treasure. Uh, we'd reduced our casualties very, very significantly. We hadn't had any losses in the final 18 months up until the tragic incident uh, at the entry control point of the International Airport in Kabul during the, the withdrawal. 
Um, and the cost in terms of treasure, if you will, was down to two or three tens of billions. Now that's a lot of money, but in a defense budget and other budgets, you know, the defense alone, 760 billion, this is doable for the United States. And one of the big lessons I think that we didn't capture at the time was that though we can't win this, and again, uh, this is so different from Iraq where during the surge, you know, which I was privileged to command, as you noted, we could drive violence down by 85%. We could literally flip the country and take it back from the brink of a full-blown Sunni Shia civil war. This was not possible in Afghanistan. The enemy had sanctuaries outside the country in Pakistan uh, and so forth. We couldn't go there with some exceptions. Um, just the entire country, very, very rugged, limited infrastructure, limited literacy, uh, limited uh, money resources, certainly compared uh, to Iraq and no real memory of strong central government among many other challenges, but we could manage it. Uh, and I think that managing an unsatisfactory outcome would have been preferable to what has transpired. Mm -hmm. um, a fair amount of which was frankly predictable. And you'll recall, I did actually out loud, you know, publicly I'm going to, say, I'm going I to fear. test your, I'm going to test your prognostication skills in a few moments. Yeah. But you're right. Uh, this is so many ways what you laid out, what your fears were at the time of the withdrawal. So I, um, I, you know, I said that I feared a psychological collapse of the Afghan forces once we learned that not just U.S. and coalition forces, who were, by the way, two and a half times the U.S. forces by that moment, but it was the contractors that we pulled out, 18,000 of them that maintained the sophisticated uh, U.S. provided helicopters, fixed wing aircraft and others that were crucial to the defensive construct uh, of having forces all around the country, which when hit, you reinforce with quite good Afghan commandos, but those forces, when they realize there's nothing coming to the rescue, there's no close air support, there's no emergency resupply, air medevac, why would they continue to fight? And their local political leaders are getting text messages from the Taliban saying, surrender or die. And so this was quite predictable, um, mm -hmm. sadly. Um, so again, I think the big takeaway is that there are times when you've just got to have strategic patience and real determination. And 20 years was not enough to get this country to the point where we could just withdraw everything uh, and expect it to continue to exist on its own. Sir John, your biggest takeaway or lesson learned? Well, um, I'm going back. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be uh, involved in this conversation with General Petraeus. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going back in my memory to what we were discussing, which of course uh, you know, was just about a month before uh, the withdrawal. <clears throat> and my memory, is, and obviously I'm reflecting my own uh, you know, comments at the time, I certainly didn't, I was less well positioned and, and less self-confident about uh, predicting precisely what was likely to go wrong and what the outcome was going to be. Uh, so although I was pessimistic, I remember thinking, uh, that Dave was more pessimistic and more precise uh, than, than I was. My memory at the time is that what I was baffled by uh, were some of the things that were being said. Uh, well, first of all, I was baffled by the choice of the, of the departure date, 9-11, which was the departure date being talked about at that time. Mm. You know, I found that very surprising um, uh, as a date. Uh, and then uh, secondly, the constant talk, I remember uh, referring to of forever wars which you know, was a very, very simplified version of the challenges that, that we faced. And, and that really goes to one of the lessons that I would like to just focus on now, and what I have definitely thought about subsequently, you know, after the, the catastrophic, really, uh, departure, which I didn't foresee, uh, uh, is really the quality of decision-making, how such an important decision was taken um, well, obviously, I've got to be careful here because I'm talking about the, basically the decision-making process in the United States, and I'm certainly not claiming that the British decision-making process is necessarily any better. But, but clearly, this was something that a lot of people had doubts about and worries about, and a lot of people um, in the policy-making process were well-positioned uh, to sort of anticipate and see the difficulties. It, somehow, uh, there was an overriding drive just to get on with it and get out. <laughs> and that goes into the quality 
of major decision making process which affects you know the whole world or certainly very large parts of the world if we're talking about the United States of America and, and so that is something that definitely you know is there in my mind uh, uncertainty uh, which is, is is there as a result of that and if that's in my mind you can be dead sure it's in other people's uh, minds including um, minds in the in the Kremlin as they look for you know, implications um, here. So that's one point. The second point has been referred to by Dave, of course, is the uh, uh, the relationship with allies. Uh, <clears throat> none of the allies were in a position really to question uh, the, the basic uh, US uh, desire to withdraw because the US commitment was so much more fundamental, so much deeper uh, than uh, other allies and of course the UK had not been contributing so sort of fighting troops as such uh, on the front line since uh, 2014. Uh, all that said uh, there was a great deal of unease certainly in London and I think you know in a number of other allied capitals when it became clear um, it, it, after April uh, that last year that that was the decision and there was a very a strong unease because people weren't being consulted. When there'd been so much effort made, uh, so many lives put at risk and indeed lost um, in the 20 years uh, since, the, um, since uh, the, 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 you know, the arrival in Afghanistan or the move into Afghanistan. Uh, it, again, I was a bit, I was quite a bit baffled. I was more than a bit, I was baffled by it and, and surprised. And it goes back to the decision uh, making uh, making process. Uh, the uh, now, of course, there are other things that have happened since that we can that we can discuss. Uh, but what I'm thinking about now uh, is, and I've been thinking about this particularly since you know thinking about what I was going to say in this conversation, uh, is how we mustn't be distracted. I mean, one definitely feels somehow that because of how badly it went, really, um, in Washington, in London, and in elsewhere. Uh, we're now trying to move on and think about something else. I mean, there are other things to think about, quite obviously. Um, and uh, we're, you know, if one is trying to really get people to think hard about what is going on now in Afghanistan, to understand the detail, to follow the detail um, at the sort of senior policy making level, I'm not sure how much brain space there is actually um, about it. Certainly, I've found something of a lack of brain space as I've tried to, to talk with, or as I've tried to talk with people about it. Um, it's partly, of course, because there are so many other things, but it's also partly a sort of innate desire just to move on from something which went badly like that. Uh, and of course, the reality is that we carry huge responsibility for what is happening now in Afghanistan, and we must continue very closely to watch and play a constructive role. Uh, and I think we'll get back to some of that um, in the questions. But again, I want to test for both of you your prognostication skills. So Dave Petraeus, something that you said in July when we first met, you said Al-Qaeda will come back. They will try to establish a sanctuary in Afghanistan. We stayed for a reason to prevent them from reestablishing that sanctuary. How do you feel about that today? Well, in fact, we just saw the director of MI5, uh, the internal security uh, apparatus in the UK, say that he's very worried about Islamist extremists. And I think I always said Al Qaeda and the Islamic State, because, of course, they are now there, uh, newly arrived in, in recent years as well. And they will maybe be the bigger concern because Al Qaeda is pretty closely tied to the Taliban. Uh, I think the Taliban has enough influence with them to persuade them not to pursue international activities, although maybe not, but they certainly don't with the Islamic State, which is actually fighting the Taliban regime uh, it, with a good deal of determination, having been a beneficiary of all the jailbreaks, if you will, that the Taliban conducted uh, en route to Kabul, where one after the other of these provincial detention facilities and then the major uh, facility were all broken open and mostly Taliban, but also uh, some Islamic State fighters uh, all exited. So the Islamic State has gotten another, perhaps as many as a thousand fighters sort of back in its ranks uh, from those who had been detained by a combination of Afghan security force uh, and coalition efforts. 
So I'm quite worried about that. Um, I'm also worried about the possibility of that taking place in Western Pakistan and the fed federally administered tribal areas, which is where Al Qaeda, of course, went after being shattered, uh, after the Taliban were taken down and Al Qaeda's uh, stronghold uh, out in Tora Bora in Eastern Afghanistan uh, was eliminated as well. Although, of course, Osama bin Laden got away and it took us a number of years uh, to track him down uh, until the spring of 2011, in fact, in fact, in my final months as the commander in Afghanistan. So I am concerned about that it, because, again, we have to keep in mind that we not only had bases in Afghanistan for the counter extremist effort inside Afghanistan, these were also the basis for our regional campaign. And again, in large measure, that really translates into various efforts that Pakistan allowed us to do. Uh, albeit not with public approval and sometimes with public criticism, but nonetheless allowed us to take certain actions, uh, again, to at the very least disrupt and degrade uh, Islamist extremists on their soil. So it, on both counts, I am quite concerned. Uh, it remains to be seen uh, how this evolves, whether the Taliban can actually uh, govern and secure the country. I have said that they will find it's a lot tougher to be counterinsurgents and counter terrorist uh, forces than it is to be insurgents. You know, it's easy to sit up in the hills and the valleys and, you know, you come out and you attack some poor checkpoint uh, of the Afghan forces and then you pull back. Um, it's a lot tougher if you're the ones actually manning all the checkpoints around the country, defending every major population center, all the critical aspects of infrastructure in the country. Uh, not to mention trying to secure the capital, Kabul. Uh, and you see, you can hear uh, the challenges that are being expressed where they talk about the importance of having good quality people on checkpoints. You know, welcome to, to the world of uh, actually being responsible for a country rather than uh, trying to take it down. Uh, Sir John, building on something that you said uh, previously as your main takeaways, you said back in July, China will wonder about U.S. sustainability and commitment over the medium to longer term. Obviously, an issue is credibility. Uh, you still believe that's true today? Yes, I do, I'm afraid. Uh, it, it, inevitably, uh, that is going to leave a medium uh, to longer term uh, thought in the minds of people who are going to want to think that um, anyway. Uh, and you know, we don't know exactly what role that's played in uh, President Putin's thinking, you know, regarding the crisis we've got, we've got now, uh, but it have played a role there somewhere. Uh, and of course, we are very conscious of it. So because of our awareness of it, you can see the way and how carefully and how we've acted and the attention given to allies and the attention given to detailed planning and everybody working 24 hours uh, uh, seven days a week and not going off on holidays and so on. All these things, um, uh, people are, well, I know, definitely, are just talking with colleagues and so on in London. They're very conscious of the need to avoid uh, the mistakes um, across um, uh, Afghanistan. That's partly organisational mistakes, but it's also, um, it's also of course, uh, mindset um, uh, mistakes, uh, definitely. And I'd also just like to say on the question of uh, security, uh, the, uh, you know, whatever I said back in back in July, of course, it's still very difficult to know really exactly what's going on day by day uh, in the detail um, across uh, you know, the large country uh, such as Afghanistan. But it is clear uh, that since August, IS, uh, ISK or ISIK, or whatever they're called, have been very resilient and have come back uh, strongly. Uh, they are, that's not Al Qaeda, but clearly they've been recruiting or you know, recruiting many, some of the same people or recruiting uh, certainly from a potential Al Qaeda members. There's all that sort of detail going on. Uh, and uh, they, uh, you know, and the, and the Taliban are finding it uh, very difficult to um, really be confident that they, uh, that they can control that. You know, if I can, so ISK, yeah. of course, is the Islamic State right. Khorasan Group, which is the element yeah. of the Islamic State operating in the Afghanistan-Pakistan right. region. 
Uh, and let's keep in mind that the Islamic State is the most uh, important international Islamist extremist element uh, in exactly. recent years. Of course, it was they who established the caliphate on the ground in exactly. northeastern Syria and northern Iraq. It was they who threatened and carried out operations, inspired, in some cases directed, uh, helped to guide operations that were carried out in uh, European cities that had those cities on huge edge uh, during the period of time. It was they who, re who attracted the recruits at the height again, of the Islamic State Caliphate, uh, again, in Iraq and Syria. But if I could add one other uh, item to, to what John just said to underscore the importance uh, of what he mentioned, which is, of course, Mark, you and I know the individuals who are in government right now. These are seriously bright people. They were all in government, most of them the entire eight years of the Obama administration. Many had been in government prior to that. Uh, they've been with uh, President Biden or other of the senior officials, again, for decades. They know that, uh, again, potential adversaries called our staying power, our dependability as allies and partners into question. And they are determined to use this current crisis in Ukraine to show that we are dependable partners. We are determined. We will consult uh, and discuss and come to agreement with our allies and partners. Uh, and in some ways, this is a, an opportunity for them. It's a tragic, terrible, horrible development uh, of enormous geopolitical consequence to see Russia uh, invade its neighbor Ukraine. But it is for the administration in Washington uh, actually in a chance for them to show that, see, we said, don't judge us based on Afghanistan, uh, judge us based on the individual merits of individual cases. And they're showing, I think, quite impressively uh, that they will consult, they will uh, help partners, they will be determined, uh, even when there is pain that is inevitably inflicted, uh, again, on our own countries, on our own economies, on our own citizens. I, I, okay, so I can I just uh, make one final, a further comment to that, which is that uh, in addition to showing resolution and determination, and we can uh, we discuss this, of course, as a separate subject in a way, uh, Ukraine, uh, and, uh, uh, another very important way of maybe correcting uh, you know, misunderstandings or whatever, or um, vulnerabilities in perception, perception vulnerabilities left over from Afghanistan, is to maintain our close interest and observation participation in the very big policy and decision challenges which are now there on the ground. You know, the, the conf I mean, the humanitarian, the dr dramatic humanitarian issues which are going on, the impact on the economy, getting the balance right in some very complicated way between, you know, providing funding and so on, and yet not providing fund for aid and humanitarian and economic growth purposes, but without providing funding to be exploited by the Taliban, exactly how you get that right, and how you get the security cooperation with the Taliban, who are, after all, the governing element in the in, in the country, and certainly my country has always traditionally um, recognized governments that are actually in control of a given country, and we haven't treated that recognition as a sign of approval or disapproval of the government uh, concern, but we haven't been able to get around that one on, on, the, on the Taliban. Uh, but the fact is the Taliban have a, you know, a shared interest with us in some way in, uh, in governing and in managing the counterinsurgency and terrorist threat uh, coming from, uh, you know, from uh, the uh, uh, from across um, Af Afghanistan. So, how on earth do we get that right? These are very complicated uh, challenges, and uh, that means brain space. It means thinking. It means top level decision making. And I, you know, I am. I, I think it's reasonable to be concerned about that at the moment. Now, let me shift to that because I think you're you're really uh, pointing out some of the issues that we need to all talk about looking forward. So even before the withdrawal, Afghanistan's economy was struggling. But since the withdrawal, things have gotten obviously dramatically worse. Three-fourths of the population are now suffering from acute poverty. Nearly 23 million out of a population of 38 million are going hungry. And Afghanistan's economy is expected to contract by 30%. 
The UN estimates that Afghanistan will need more than $8 billion in foreign assistance. And that's 25% more than the UN is spending on all global peacekeeping missions. So what do we do? How do we move forward given all that's going on? Sir John, uh, how do we take this on? What, how do we strike that balance? We want to help the people of Afghanistan. They're not the enemy, very obviously. And yet none of us wants uh, the, uh, the Taliban leadership to be enriched by or take advantage of some of the resources that might be provided. How do we do that? How do we strike that balance? Well, um, I mean, if I can just quickly, uh, in a way, add to what you were just saying there with a quote um, that uh, I think David Miliband, who I used to work for, um, <clears throat> uh, for in CNN, UNDP predicts in a few months, 97% of Afghans could be living below international poverty line of $1.90 a day. 2% of Afghans have enough food today. 9 million at risk of famine, 1 million children at risk of dying from starvation, starvation, close quotes. In, in other words, uh, the, it is you know, immediate and dramatic. So some kind of compromise uh, has got to be found. Now I know that you know, the administration and others are looking very carefully, sorry for the door going behind me, uh, looking very carefully um, um, at ways of doing this, and in particular, uh, how to manage the uh, the frozen funds, uh, unfreeze them, uh, manage part of them, half of them, I think, um, uh, making it available uh, for putting money into aid funds and trust funds, um, World Bank controlled um, entities, um, and, uh, and, and so on. And then slightly strangely, actually, um, although I, I realize it's a difficult area, the other half being held back uh, for legal claims I mean, I know there's quite a lot of complicated controversy about that, but it's a reminder of how complicated uh, these decisions um, are and the frozen funds. And, the, and then, of course, uh, responding to the pressures um, on the central bank and, of course, the pressures on the, um, on the, cur on the currency as a result of that. Um, somehow trying to find ways of, I mean, really understanding and knowing who it is within the Taliban government uh, who is trying, who is trying to be realistic and reasonably sensible about this. Uh, and I mean, from the limited amount I know, I'm all, already aware that there are some individuals with previous serious governance experience who are trying to find a way, uh, find a way through, maintain capabilities, you know, planning and management capabilities at the right kind of, the uh, right kind of level, uh, trying to build up um, local investment, locally driven investment, so you're not sort of living off uh, debt all the time, not that there's funding for the debt in, in, in any case, and that's and so on. I mean, there's a lot of detailed work like that, which um, has to be done. The key thing is somehow to find the right channels uh, for managing uh, and overseeing uh, the, the management of, of the funding uh, so that there is a you know, reasonable chance that it is going to the right people. I mean, to a significant extent, that is already beginning, beginning to happen. But it does mean, of course, uh, not, you know, not taking too, I too ideological position and accepting at the end of the day that for good or bad, the Taliban um, are, are, the, are the government and are likely to remain so for the foreseeable future. And certainly if the alternative is ISIK, that's not great. Yeah. So General Petraeus, this is obviously always the tough call. Uh, so what should President Biden do? Uh, again, it's, it's, a, it, it's politically delicate and difficult, uh, especially at a time when taxpayers are being called upon to fund humanitarian needs in so many parts of the world. And sadly, as Ukraine continues to uh, develop, that's only going to get worse. So General Petraeus, what, what what does the Biden administration do here? Well, keeping in mind that they also have to grapple with domestic politics issues in, a, in an election year, uh, certainly for the uh, congressional elections. Um, I think they're roughly doing what they need to do, which is to take the available resources um, and divvying them up. A lot of us don't like that second part of the divvying up for legal cases and so forth. But again, I think it's just a domestic imperative yeah, that is inescapable. 
and then try to figure out how to take the, the other resources, which are quite considerable, they're well over three, approaching $4 billion, uh, figure out how to provide those through partners on the ground uh, who can get the assistance directly to the Afghan people and not strengthen the Taliban uh, and not enrich the Taliban. Again, very, very difficult to do in the country, but uh, that's the, the objective here. And also mm -hmm. still trying to figure out something that is very, very important as well, which is how to meet our moral obligation to the individuals who we said, if you serve two years on the ground with our soldiers uh, as a battlefield interpreter, we'll allow you to apply for a special immigrant visa uh, to come to the United States, not just you, but your family. And so there are over 60,000 names of individuals who were battlefield translators, interpreters, uh, and their family members who are literally left behind in Afghanistan. We also have to do that uh, because that's an obligation. Again, as I said, this is a moral obligation. The eyes of the world are on this about uh, that issue very much as well. And if we think that we're going to need host nation partners in the future, and we will always, uh, then you've got to honor the obligations to those who have risked uh, their security and that of their families to help us uh, in the past. And that's before we even talk about all the other Afghans who didn't meet those precise uh, conditions, but who worked closely with us, who again endangered themselves and their family members uh, by being part of what it is that we were all trying to do together. So that's another massive challenge uh, that mm -hmm. is out there, a very domestically tricky issue involving again uh, immigration uh, from uh, an Islamic country. So this has got its challenges, but it's one that we have to figure out how to, to honor, uh, again, this obligation that we have to meet that obligation. So again, I think in general, they are going forward on this. The real issue here though, Mark, is that once that money is, is spent uh, and once the, you know, we are the biggest donor by far, the US just committed over 300 million additional dollars uh, in January to further humanitarian assistance for Afghanistan, far and away the biggest, uh, again, contributor to that effort. Um, we will not sustain the kind of funding that actually uh, inflated that economy that really kept it going. Uh, we provided it, together, the US and the coalition provided somewhere well over 75% at least of the Afghan budget. We paid for all of their security forces uh, well over 200,000 of them, all of their equipment, uh, operational expenses, maintenance, uh, everything else connected with that. The Taliban just, there's no way they can replace that. In a great year, uh, right. Afghanistan could generate maybe one to $2 billion, as you'll remember from your time as the yep. director of AID, uh, in their own revenue. This is not Iraq that if you get the oil pipelines patched up, they can generate $100 billion in oil revenue. Uh, this is Afghanistan. And so in many ways, this tragic hardship, this collapsed economy uh, is not going to be brought back. And certainly the Taliban are not the individuals who in, will inspire uh, outside investors to flock to Afghanistan. That would be what is called adventure capital. Uh, not even venture capital. So yeah. I think the, the future of Afghanistan is very, very bleak. Um, and uh, you're going to see a considerable exodus. You know, if, if you thought the uh, outflow of refugees from Syria was substantial, uh, a country in which half of the population was displaced, half of that displaced actually out of the country, just wait until this deepens in Afghanistan uh, and until they're able to figure out how to get out of the country, something that's not easy right now. But Pakistan obviously is going to face an enormous challenge as a result of this. There's probably approaching uh, a million Afghans back on their soil already. And this is after we spent nearly 20 years getting Afghans back home from places like Pakistan because there were new opportunities while, while we were there and supporting the government, supporting their security efforts and supporting uh, their efforts to build an economy. So the future, I think, uh, again, is, is, is very, very bleak uh, for Afghanistan. This is a problem. It's not going out of our rear view mirror. It's going to stay there. And sometimes it'll get bigger uh, because of the issues. And these are fellow human beings. 
and it will be the biggest humanitarian catastrophe in the world if it's not already uh, in that category. So gentlemen, in the brief time we have left, I'm gonna to switch to an, another topic. Uh, so General Petraeus, one of the things that you pointed to six months ago, uh, you were very skeptical about the notion of over the horizon counterterrorism efforts. And you question whether that was ever going to be a viable uh, policy or strategy. And what we've seen recently, a, a UN report that came out just two weeks ago, it says that there are no signs that the Taliban has taken steps to limit the activities of foreign terrorist fighters in the country. On the contrary, terrorist groups seem to enjoy greater freedom there than at any time in recent history. And yet the notion of over the horizon, which is what publicly the U.S. seems to have, have uh, dedicated itself to, we see very few signs that that's actually developing and is going to work. Enormous challenges here. Again, keep in mind that these are the last bases we had, not just, as I mentioned earlier, for the counterterrorism effort uh, in Afghanistan, but also for the one regionally. Uh, and in that sense, uh, again, we'd already lost the final base that we had in Pakistan. We lost our bases in the Central Asian states that could be used for this. It's very unlikely that they're going to allow us to build bases from which we can actually fly uh, armed intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance assets, drones. So what we're reduced to then is flying out of the Gulf states, uh, depending on which one and depending on where in Afghanistan you're trying to go. Uh, if it's the south or the south or the northeast, uh, you can spend 60% or more of the time that that aircraft can fly just getting to and from uh, the location of the orbit in Afghanistan in which you're trying to maintain a so-called unblinking eye, as opposed to tens of minutes from the various bases that we had all around Afghanistan that would enable us to do that very, very quickly. So it's a huge effort. Uh, just to maintain one unblinking eye, much less the many, many unblinking eyes that we used to have. And of course, those unblinking eyes used to be informed um, be based on human intelligence that we had, signals intelligence, uh, imagery intelligence, all of these that were facilitated by having these quite substantial bases uh, in Afghanistan. And of course, needless to say, there were intelligence activities uh, that used very much the military footprint, the lily pads that we had, and depended on the military for quick reaction force, air medevac, uh, air support, and everything else in a tough spot. So none of that is available, and we're basically reduced in large measure to trying to, you know, reassemble some degree of human intelligence network uh, from neighboring countries to the extent that you can do that, um, and then to again gleaning what we can. Uh, from the limited intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance architecture that we can put uh, overhead in Afghanistan. Obviously, there are other capabilities we can bring to bear that we always have brought to bear uh, in various cases. And, and you know, that would include, obviously, again, signals, cyber, and, and so forth. Even social media uh, now can be a, a very, very helpful source of information. Uh, but it is much, much more difficult from afar. Uh, and, you know, and I, I can affirm that as you know, former CIA director, uh, not just former commander on the ground and in the region, as Ken John, uh, as a former uh, head of MI6. And, and Sir John, I was gonna turn to you. Uh, similar skepticism on, on uh, relying upon uh, over the horizon capabilities uh, well, yes, when sir. you don't have on the ground, uh, eyes and ears on the ground? Uh, yes, well, uh, frankly, I had complete skepticism about it, and I was very unhappy uh, that such things were being said. Um, uh, you know, maybe, uh, obviously, uh, intelligence collection and, and uh, capabilities and uh, data and so on has changed or is changing all the time. Uh, but uh, I, uh, all my experience uh, is that, you know, you, you have capabilities on the ground. And, and, and it's detail, it's knowledge of what's going on the ground, it's understanding of it. it inevitably, there's a human source um, element uh, to that. And, uh, and, and on top of that, it's not just that we lost that, you know, it, it, immediately on the ground in Afghanistan itself, but our capabilities are, are obviously so complicated in the regional context 
um, and the regional relationships between all the states surrounding Afghanistan and none of and none of those relationships, uh, well, first of all, none of those relationships with Afghanistan or with each other uh, are straightforward, and they're certainly not straightforward with uh, <clears throat> with the U.S. and with uh, NATO and uh, and so on. So, I, I I don't like it when things are said somehow to get us through, you know, a particular debate and a particular problem, and it oversimplifies the um, the question. I, I do just want to say one other thing, if I may. <clears throat> Uh, just you know, thinking about you know, the future and so going forward, and what we haven't touched on here in this dis in this discussion is the fact that for all our worries, um, as we've reflected in, in uh, regarding the situation uh, on the ground in, in Afghanistan now, and of course we've flagged up the economy and humanitarian aid and so on, uh, we do need to remember how much things did change between 2001 and 2021. Uh, I mean, just looking at the, the basic population statistics and how the population has doubled uh, in, in Afghanistan in those uh, 20 years and how the mean age, unsurprisingly, is 18, I think I'm right in saying. Uh, and, and of course, uh, inevitably, attitudes and so on have changed. And uh, if you hear you know, from people, and I haven't been back there, but if you hear from people who, who have been there or are there at the moment or whatever, uh, and who are able to make some comparison between, let's say, Kabul, even now, and what it was like 20 plus years ago, it is clearly uh, very different. So uh, a, a lot in, in terms of building up civil society in sort of all the various res uh, varying respects that's relevant, a lot was achieved. It hasn't all automatically been lost. There hasn't been a complete reversion uh, to what existed before, uh, by any means, actually, I think. And, and that's another thing that somehow or another, we and our policy makers and decision makers have got to focus on thinking about playing the right role and getting the, doing the right things for the future. Uh, Sir John, uh, as uh, in my case, the former head of USAID, I know that unfortunately, good news rarely sells, right? A, a plane landing safely is not news. Uh, and yet what we've tried to show at the Wilson Center, if you take a look at that period of time, the remarkable human gains from girls' education to yes. girls and women having a seat at the table, those are gains that people can be very proud of. They were hard fought, hard earned, and yet yeah. I think we're obviously all concerned that, that they're at risk. Uh, Sir John, uh, General Petraeus, uh, thank you for helping us today as we reflect upon six months since the withdrawal. Thank you for co-chairing the Global Advisory Council. Uh, we really do appreciate your leadership and all that you do for us. Uh, to those who are watching, this has been Hindsight Upfront Afghanistan. And for more information, you can go to the Wilson Center website and take a look at a treasure trove of materials that'll help you understand uh, Afghanistan, where we've come from, where we are, and even looking ahead to the future. Thanks very much. Thank you.